Can you imagine what it would be like if there wasn't love? Can you picture what life would become? Without love, there'd be no compassion, no comfort, no peace. Without love, there'd be no caring, no giving, no kindness. Without love, we would be consumed by selfishness and filled with arrogance. Without love, grace would have never been offered. Mercy would have been unimaginable. When you add love to the equation, everything changes. Love is patient, love is kind, not envious or prideful. Love puts others before ourselves, chooses peace over anger. Love protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. Love changes everything. Good morning, everybody. I'm super pumped and excited to jump in with you guys to part four of our message series, Say You Love Me Without Saying You Love Me. And if you guys have been rolling on, on this series with us and you've been... Uh, checking it out in person or online or podcast, you know this message series is all about really discovering what the Bible has to say about what a true foundation of love is and how love is supposed to be projected through behavior, not just words, right? None of us just like to be told, I love you, but treated poorly, right? The best way to convey love is always through action. Last week, we uh, talked about breakups and how sometimes uh, in the Bible, there's room open uh, God gives room for when breakups are appropriate or when breakups are the best decision. However, we recognize that it's actually God's will that relationships work out. It's God's will that all our relationships, our friendships, that there's peace, that there's unity. That's God's perfect will. However, sometimes, right, there's things we just can't get over in relationships. There's offenses there that uh, one party's willing to let go, the other's not. And in that case, the Bible does open a window for when it is okay to separate. So guys, I caution you to go back and listen to that message because I think we live in a day in society where we are changing relationships like we change our socks in the morning. And that's not God's will. So go back, listen to that. But today, we're really just diving into one of the greatest barriers to you experiencing the love of God. So many of us go through life, right? And uh, we question sometimes, is God really for me? I know his word says that, right? If you've been in church for any length of time, you're like, yeah, I've heard, I've heard that God's for me. He's not against me. But sometimes I just feel very distant from God. Sometimes though I'm told he forgives me, I feel like I don't have the forgiveness of God. I feel dirty inside. I feel dirty outside. Some of us feel like I can't get over my past and my past is always chasing me. And is God really going to forgive me for that? right? Because I've done some things. The problem is uh, we project all of those life experiences into our relationships. And so many of us feel very distant from God this morning and distant in other relationships because of hurts and wounds that we've carried in our lives. And today I'm believing by faith that uh, God's got an opening, uh, a door opening for some of you. I, I know that some of you for too long, have been struggling with feeling rejected. You feel unloved. You feel like, man, I just want a place or a family or people that I can belong to. But no matter how many people around you, how many of you know that even when you're surrounded by plenty, man, if something's going on inside, you could still feel completely, completely alone. But uh, let's open the... Uh, discussion today with a little bit of scripture. We're going to go back, provide some context. Last week, we were working through the story of Paul, and in scripture, we're going to see his name as Saul, right? Saul is the Hebrew version of the Greek, which we know him as Paul. And this guy is a persecutor of the church, uh, and he's on his road to Damascus. He's going there with a couple uh, of his guys, right? And he's going to round up Christians, and he wants to throw them in jail, and he wants to kill them. He's got a complete pass, but what he thinks he's doing is right. He actually feels completely justified, and that's actually the problem for many of us with deception, that even when we live in a false reality, the problem with a false reality is that we still think it's completely true. When we're deceived, the problem is we don't know we are deceived. How many of you have ever had that moment in relationships and people are like, it didn't happen that way. It didn't go down like that. And you're like, well, that's how I remember it. That's how I see it. The problem is deception, we never recognize that it's deception. And that's where Paul was at. He was living a life of deception, thinking the persecution of the church was the right way to go. So he's on the road to Damascus. And in that moment, 
he experiences the risen Lord, right? This is after Jesus' death, after his resurrection, after his ascension. Jesus decides to show himself to Paul. In all of Paul's life, he went through life denying the risen Lord. And, and in this moment, you can only imagine, right? He falls off his horse. There's a light that blinds him. It's so bright. And in that moment, he hears a voice that says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul's response is, Lord, who is it that I persecute? And he's like, it's me, Jesus. Now I gotta tell you, if that was me, at that moment, my jaw would drop, my heart would stop pounding, and I would be like, oh, snap. I've been told it's true, right? So in that moment, you know he was convicted. Now some of us use the word conviction uh, out of context. We think conviction is only when we've done something wrong, and we equate conviction, spiritual conviction, to your conscience. It's much more than a conscience. It does much more than discern right and wrong. To be convicted biblically means to be convinced. And in that moment, Paul was convinced of a few things. I was wrong. I'm persecuting the church. That's Jesus's bride. I was wrong about Jesus. I was wrong about everything. Did you ever have that moment in life where you recognize you were wrong about everything? And for some of you today, you may have never had that moment. But I pray today that God is gonna show you the things you are wrong about regarding yourself because it's the single most greatest barrier to you experiencing love. Say you love me without saying you love me. Even if people in our lives do a good job at loving you fully, completely, sacrificially, if you're wounded in that area, you will never receive their love. You will always have a wall up. There will always be something there that is keeping you, a maladaptive behavior, a coping mechanism that keeps them distant because I'm protecting me. I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to be vulnerable with people in my life. And, and in that moment, Paul was convinced. And I believe by faith today, some of you are going to be convinced that, man, there's things going on in my life that still need healing. No matter where you're at in your walk, whether you're a Christ follower for 25 years, maybe you're new to the faith or you're spiritually seeking, the reality is there's something here for you. The gospel of peace will set you free and bring healing to your life so that you may receive love the way God has always intended it. And we can remove these barriers in our lives. So of course, Paul falls off uh, the horse. He has this, this come to Jesus moment. And then Jesus says, I need you to go into the town. There's gonna be a man named Ananias and he's gonna put his hands on you and he's gonna heal you. And he's gonna, he's gonna test, give you testimony about me. And then on the other side, God is talking, working with Ananias. And he's like, Ananias, you know who Paul is. You know what he's done. You know why he's come here. And he is my chosen instrument. I want you to go to him. And I want you to give him the gospel of peace. I want you to lay hands on him so that he can still, so that he could be healed. How many of you believe healing still happens today? Yeah. And it's by faith, I believe, that if you open your heart to God, you're going to experience a tremendous healing today in your life that will open up what God has always had for you. So we're going to pick up the story with Acts chapter 9, verse 13. Lord Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with the authority of the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, say go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and he entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, brother, Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road uh, as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. Say, so see again. And he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. It's, it's my belief that if you open your heart today, you're going to be able to see again. Some of us have been wearing scales for way too long, even as Christ followers. And it's God's will for your life that the scales would come off so that you may know God and you may know yourself. That is something that has been ministering me for the last few weeks now is that simple prayer. God, may I know you. And may I know myself because it's in knowing myself and being honest about these areas of my life that I've been protecting so long that Jesus can bring healing. He wants to heal your life, but what you don't surrender to him and you hold back, you are not giving to him to heal in your life. And it's in understanding my brokenness that I understand the greatness of God. It's in understanding my need that I understand him as provider. So many of us have been so busy putting walls around us for so long that it actually inhibits us from seeing God for who, who he truly is and what he can truly do in your life. Early in my marriage, I needed a heart reset, which also happens to be the message title today. I needed a heart reset because you see, 
all our beliefs in life, every belief you have, it comes from somewhere. Some of you remember the term tabula rasa, which you may have learned in early college years, maybe in sociology class or psychology 101. Essentially, the theory behind that is children are born like a blank slate. We have tendencies, we have a personality, but what we come to believe in life is what someone has spoken to us. Think about every belief you have in this life. Everything you believe about history, why do you believe it? Because somebody told you it was true. And then maybe there was sufficient evidence, but that's not how life starts. Life, go to kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade. You believe what your teachers tell you. You believe what your family tells you. You believe what anybody tells you. And you don't question it. As you get older, there's some things that we start to question. And there's some things we just blankly, you know, we just blindly, I should say, believe without question. So every belief you have has originated with some sort of life experience or some sort of voice that has spoken into your life. The problem is I entered marriage with really poor beliefs that I didn't know were wrong. You see, I had this I can do attitude, which on the surface is great. I had this attitude of I just need to be a make it happen kind of person. And I did, and I made things happen, and I pushed through resistance, and God gave me the ability to do that. I have this belief, this undying belief, that if someone else can do something, I can figure it out and do it. If they can do it, I can do it. Like, that's just in me. And the problem with that belief going through life, there's another side to it, an ugly side. So the doing of it is very seductive. But see, I grew up in a context where, as a young man, I felt, um, felt like I was a burden. I felt like early on in my life that whenever I asked for things, I would be told, you ask for too much. You don't deserve that. If you want that, you need to make it happen. Now, you might argue, hey, my parents are trying to help me to be strong. That's fine. But my takeaway early on was, if something has to be done, I have to do it. Then I uh, get a little older and I start working with my, my dad, my uncles, and, and these are immigrants, right, off the boat Italians, and they had the old story, I came here with 35 cents in my pocket, and to have the American dream, you got to work for it. Nobody's going to give you anything, and you got to fight for everything you have, and I grew up believing that. Now, that is true. That was their experience. The problem is when you project that into Areas that should not be projected and you rob yourself. Here I married a wonderful woman who wanted to serve me and love me. And what she learned about me very early on in our marriage is that uh, Armando doesn't want help. He does everything on his own. And when I offer, honey, I want to love you. I want to serve you. I want to come alongside you. Do you need help with this? I want help with this. I would rationalize why I didn't need help. Oh, it's okay. It takes one person to do it. But really, what was I fearing that I was going to be let down? I didn't know this. I was completely unaware of it. All as I knew is that I had a pattern of behavior. That's where some of you were at today. Why do I do the things I do? Why am I that way? Why does that come out of me? Why am I moody? And some of us, if we lack insight and self-assessment, we're told that by people who love us. Why are you that way? Why do you do that? Why do you always say that? So Jo Marie would ask me. She would say, honey, why is it every time that you look like you're doing something, I want to help, you tell me no. What I was actually doing unknowingly was robbing myself of a blessing of God through her. You see, healthy relationships, when God wants to bless you, what does God do? He brings relationships into your life. People who will walk, walk alongside you, people who will celebrate you, people that will lift you up, people that will grieve with you. Starting to sound like the church, right, in scripture, right? What are we told? That when one grieves, we all grieve with them. When they celebrate, we celebrate with them. What I was doing was depriving myself of love because of an early life experience. You see, any maladaptive behavior, every difficulty you have in relationships, it's generally going to come from something you believe that you bring into the relationship. It's not them. The problem isn't often them. The problem sometimes is, is ourselves. And we believe some crummy things, right? Some of us, you know that you are bringing stuff into the marriage. If you have beliefs like, or the relationship or the friendship, like, hey, guys are no good. They're going to eventually leave you. We create generalities to protect ourselves from letdown, from hurt, from abandonment. We believe things like, oh, women are no good. They're going to cheat on you. Oh, I'm not going to get married because I never saw a good one, a good marriage. They all ended divorce. So I'm going to protect myself. Man, I'm not going to have kids. Kids are a burden. They're better off seen right, than heard. Right? We start to believe, I had a bad childhood. So why am I going to have kids? And, and, and what we start to recognize is we start living in fear. Some of us say this statement, I didn't have these things growing up. I want to give my kids everything I never had. We think it's good, but we're actually blinded to the outcome that our kids are not us. They don't have our experiences. And the truth is, if we do that blindly, we're creating a situation where our kids are going to be trained to be entitled children who are selfish as adults. 
and think that the world is just going to give them everything. Like there's a balance. See, my desire in relationships is to do relationships out of health, not out of my wounds. To do relationships out of health, not out of the things I never had. To do it out of health and wisdom, not out of my emotional vulnerabilities. And what ends up happening is we project. You see, you're all going to project. You do not have a choice if you project. Your, your brain is wired that way. But you do have a choice on what you project. That, we're going to come back to that truth because what we're going to see is that Paul, he really caught the gospel. He really understood it. And from that, he was able to project from a place of health and not a place of depreciation, a place of pain. He was able to project from a place of gain in his life. And my hope for you is that this can, this can unlock for you the ability to actually start to receive love from people around you, to start tearing down those walls. Because what we recognize is the greatest hindrance to your life are your self-protective behaviors. It's your maladaptive coping mechanisms. And on the other extreme, it's people who believe they need to punish themselves because they can't get over the bad stuff they did or, how, or what they believe about themselves. You see, you cannot be loved experientially unless you love you. You cannot experience love unless you know who you are in the eyes of God. Because when you feel bad about you and you're angry at yourself and you just can't let that go, you settle for relationships that will abuse you and use you. You see, when God wants to bless you, he sends relationships. But when the enemy wants to curse you, he sends relationships too. And those relationships, we have a choice which ones we open or which ones we close the door to in our lives. And the way you do relationships says everything about your place of healing. You, you could be a Christ seeker, seeking faith, don't know what you believe about faith, or you could be a Christ for 25 years and you may be saved. But if your heart doesn't change, if you don't find healing, you're gonna continue down the same road for the rest of your life, experiencing relationship after relationship that eerily feel similar and it's what we're projecting in. Guys, we're always bringing stuff into our relationships. My hope for you today is that you can bring in from a place of gain and not a place of pain. How do you know these wounds get in the way? You lack trust of people around you. Look, you can't trust everybody, we know that. But you know a tree by its fruit. If we're sitting there surrounded by good people, right, who's good, right? <laughs> Nobody but God, but people who are bearing good fruit, they're nice, they're kind, they're loving, they're gracious, they speak positivity, they're for me, they celebrate me. They don't speak bad about other people behind their backs, right? These people, if, if they're there in our lives and we don't open our hearts to them, like I didn't with my wife, you're robbing yourself. And you know what? You become the devil's favorite kind of Christian, which is an isolated Christian. If you can't take the risk of trusting even one person in your life, it's also indicative of the fact that we can't trust God. Some of us, you know what? We mistreat it. And all we see is an angry God who wants to penalize us. And it's not what scripture shows us. You may know the truth, but experientially, your emotions tell you something so different. The other way we know that uh, our wounds get in the way is false beliefs about others. We talked about those generalizations, right? That we, hey, they're all bad. I had a bad church experience. This one's gonna be bad. That one's gonna be bad. Every church is gonna fail me, so I'm gonna do life alone. Become the devil's favorite kind of Christian. False beliefs about self, dysfunctional patterns. Maybe you're in a relationship today that, you're, that you need to go back to last week's message. And you're being beaten up emotionally. You can't see the light through the, through the trees. Some of us feel discomfort and intimacy. You know, looking in people's eyes when you communicate. I can't make eye contact. You might be that person. And you got to ask yourself, why? You know, I, when people get close and touch me, I don't, I don't like to be touched. Why? What does that say about your level of healing? It says a lot about what you went through. But have you gone through that journey with Christ to heal you? Because your greatest hindrance... It's so what's happening on the inside, and we need healing for that. Let's jump back into this, uh, into this story, Acts 9, verse 15. The Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to the people of Israel. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. All we see in this story um, is a very small snapshot of what Ananias knew, right? Before this, God is responding to Ananias' admission. God, I'm scared. I know who this man is. I know what he came here to do. He's the persecutor of the church. And God says to him, Ananias, he's my chosen instrument. He encountered the living God. And I can only imagine in that moment, Ananias receiving that from the Lord. Yeah, we know he acted obediently, but, but this is what enabled him to act obediently. So you also can't truly love unless you've experienced love in your life. 
Look, if you are a person who sees the negative in other people, if you're a person who uh, talks bad about people behind their back, if you're a person who struggles not to be judgmental, it's because you still feel that way about you inside. Guys, let's just pull back the curtain for a moment and let's be real. Anything you're putting out there in your behavior and projections is indicative of what's happening in here first. And when you are healed by Jesus, when you truly have allowed God to love you and you've been able to remove that barrier in your way, you then can project that love of God back to others. And Ananias in that moment, I imagine, is sitting there and going, God, I got it. You saved me, God. Jesus, I was just as sinful as Paul. Yeah, I had a different type of background. Yeah, I did different things. But God, if you can save me through the gospel of peace, I imagine you can save Paul. Guys, and that's such, such good news for you today because no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, the gospel of peace can save you and bring you hope. The gospel of peace is not just for the life to come. God desires you to live a life abundantly here on earth and in your relationships, but we have to remove the barriers. And because Ananias understood the saving power of Jesus, that means he got and he understood the gospel. For so many of us, you're, you're sitting there in your past not realizing that the secret to your healing and experiencing love is, the, is projecting from a place of, of healing, not from a place, a place of pain. But in order to do that, you have to really get the gospel. You have to understand it. And, and what is the understanding the gospel? That I was a sinner in need of salvation. There was literally nothing I can do to experience the love of God, the relationship with God. I was completely disconnected. Not just in feeling, but in truth. And then Jesus was sent by God because he loves you, because you're so valuable to him. And he hung himself on that cross to pay your sin debt. And that means like an eraser, all of your sins, all of your past was wiped away. Nothing you've ever done, nothing you've ever said, nothing you ever thought is behind you. The thing you did last week, if you're walking in the truth of God and you're living a repentant life, God promises to forgive you fully and completely. You don't have to wear it anymore. And because you don't have to wear it anymore, you don't need to project from that place of wound anymore. So Ananias, he got that. And it's important for you to understand this, no matter where you're at in your spiritual journey, you will never have peace with God experientially unless you really get the gospel. So many of us are like, pastor, I get it. I know Jesus died for me. I get it. I know that my sins are forgiven, that I'm going to heaven, but I still feel distant from God. I still feel completely dirty. What do I do about that? You see, you also got to stop and ask yourself, what is it you're feeding in your life? What thoughts are you feeding? Guys, it's not just you. It's not just your thoughts. There is a real devil, right? So some of the church today believes that Lucifer was just, you know, kind of a fake story. Guys, the Bible attests that he is absolutely real and he's an enemy to your soul. But here's the good news. He's completely defeated. You don't need to fear him. When Jesus hung himself on the cross for your sins, the devil didn't put him there. He knew the price he had to pay. He put himself there to pay your sin debt. And then when he conquered death and sin, the enemy was completely defeated when he rose. And it's the fact that he rose that signifies to us, that gives us the confidence that what he did on the cross was real. See, if Jesus just said, I'm dying for your sins and hung himself on the cross and never resurrected, there'd be no power in that. We wouldn't be talking about it today. But the fact that he rose reminds you and I that everything he said is completely true. Why? Because I'm willing, to, uh, I'm willing to believe a man who rose from the dead. Because he's God. Completely. And it has power. So the devil is a real force in your life who's defeated, except he has one battlefield. Your mind. Your mind. And, and here's the thing. What are you feeding? God, I know your truth but I feel this way. Why? Because I hang out with those thoughts. When the thought comes that I'm not good enough, I sit in that. I think about that. I fantasize that. When the thought comes that, man, I'm never going to get healing, I sit in that. I dwell in that. What's going to happen if the seeds you continue to water in your life are complete lies? You will grow a lie. Yeah. And you will live that lie. And that's the problem with the lie, that if you believe a lie, you're going to live life like it's true. So what, I, what do you do? What does Scripture say? Scripture says to starve that. If that thought comes, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough. No, 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 devil, you don't get it. Man, I am, I am bought and paid for by Jesus. You can't remind me of my past. Why? Because it's been erased, completely gone. Man, you tell me I'm a victim? No, 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 no. The Bible says I'm a victor. You tell me that I'm defeated? No, man, I have victory in Christ Jesus. He fights my battles. I don't need to fight you. You lost when he, got, when he rose from the dead. You say I'm never gonna measure up. You know, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
You want me to focus on my past? Man, my eyes, they don't focus on my problems. I lift them to the hills where my hope comes from, from the creator of heaven and earth. Devil, you want me to think negative? I'm not in agreement with that. The problem is so many of us, we've been hanging out there too long. You see, control your thoughts, you'll control your life. If your life feels out of control, your relationships feels out of control, it's because you're letting your thoughts run rampant. And there's a real devil there that is pushing your thoughts and reminding you of your past. Romans 12, 2 says this, do not be conformed by the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So then you will be able to test and approve God's perfect and pleasing will. Think about this. Don't take on the pattern of the world. Don't think like they think. Don't do what they do. Don't wear what they wear. Don't take that upon yourself. Man, the whole world is telling you, oh, if you just project positivity out into the world, you're going to receive it back. How's that working out for you? The power of positive thinking by a whole bunch of broken people. If you could fix it, if I could fix it, none of us would be sitting here, right? We've all realized, and every one of us, man, let your conscience give testimony. We've all chased the best of what the world has to offer. And it's always come up empty. It's always overpromised, always chronically underdelivered. There's a point where you got to get honest and say, that didn't do it for me. Jesus, I'm taking a risk on you in faith. Taking a risk, Lord. Where's your peace going to come from? If you're not running to God and buying into the Bible and actually applying those truths to your life through action, that's what faith is. Faith is your belief in action. If I'm not interrupting every negative thought and replacing it with biblical truth, all you got is you. And you know what? Me by myself, I got no hope. But me plus Jesus is a majority. You plus Jesus is a majority. You plus Jesus, you're going to have victory. Jesus does the work. All I got to do is show up. That's your work, right? And that doesn't gain you salvation. That's only through Jesus. But that's the action step you have to take. Jesus opens the door because you were worth fighting for. You had no hope, and I'm going to open the door of hope. You had no forgiveness. I'm going to open the door of forgiveness. But you have to walk in and say, Jesus, I'm here. Do your work in my life. Because without that, you never experience the gospel of peace, being transformed by the renewing of your mind. I love that. It means you have to take on a new pattern and a new way of thinking and the renewing of your mind. You know what that means? Man, I'm going to grab God's truth. Every time a negative lie pops into my head, I'm going to grab God's truth, and I'm going to repeat it. I'm going to memorize it. I'm going to meditate over it. And you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to project it out there. Because you don't have a choice if you project. You do have a choice what you project. And you're either going to project from a place of pain or you're going to project from a place of gain in your life. So you know what? I'm going to grab the word of God as a rebuttal, as a correction for every lie I ever think so that my heart can be healed and I no longer have a barrier to being able to experience love the way God had, has it for me in my life. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, brother, say brother. Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has also sent me that you may see again. Say see again. And be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, here's the beauty about the gospel. Man, I come to Jesus as a hot mess. How many hot messes met Jesus once, right? A lot. Sometimes even as a Christ follower, I'm still feeling like a hot mess. But here's the beauty of the gospel. I come to Jesus with all my junk, and all my labels, and all my bad names, but I, I leave a son of God. I never encounter God with a bad label, not leaving with a good label. You know what? Ananias knew that. And he says, when I met Jesus, I was nothing. And after I met Jesus, I became something. Paul, you were a persecutor of the brethren. You're a liar. You're, you're a murderer. But you know what? After you met Jesus, I now call you brother. Amen? Amen. Man, what a wonderful new beginning the gospel of peace. And that's the power of the gospel in your life. It doesn't just save your soul. It doesn't just reconcile you with God. It's meant to bring you peace. You mean, God, I don't have to carry that anymore? I don't have to wear that anymore? I don't have to think about that anymore? I don't have to feed that anymore? No, he takes it completely off your shoulders and I'm able to walk a life of peace. I'm able to put my head down on my pillow at the end of the night knowing whatever I did in the day, he is faithful and just to forgive me. God, I'm sorry. And when I put my head down on my pillow at the end of the night, I sleep in peace. Why? Because he is just. Why? Because he's true. And if he's for me, who could be against me? I'm gonna project from that place in my life. I'm gonna project that in my marriage, in my friendships, in all my relationships. And you know what? That's going to change my heart. And the way that also projects is not only now am I experiencing love, but I can truly give it. 
And you know what? When I look at people who are at where I once was, I don't judge them anymore. I want for them what I receive. You see, if you struggle with that judgment, if you struggle looking at people with a cynical eye, thinking they're up to no good, they may be. But that's not for you. That's between them and God. But the fact that we do that is indicative of the absence of healing that still needs to take place in our life. You have to sign up and say, Jesus, you thought I was worth fighting for. Jesus, you thought, Lord God, you thought so much of me. Your word says that I'm a child of God, an heir to the throne of God, that I'm completely grafted in. If I'm worth fighting for, then I need to fight for me too. So many of you, God fought for you, but you're not fighting for yourselves. And and when you internalize the gospel of peace, the fight gets easy because all I got to do is walk through the door he already opened. Jesus, I surrender my, my life, my hope, my future, my sins to you, God. I want to follow you, Jesus. I'll chase after you because, man, this world gives me nothing, Lord God, and you fill my hands completely with everything. It's, it's the birth of a new beginning in your life. That's the gospel of peace. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained strength. Some of us guys have been living with scales for too long. Would you say right now in faith, Holy Spirit, remove those scales from my eyes? Remove those scales from my eyes. Remove those scales from my eyes so that I may see again, so that I may see what you see. I may see and understand who I really am, that I may know you, that I may know myself, Lord God. Lord God, may I see what you see, God, not what the world has told me, not my wounds, not my past, not my history. May I hold on to the truth of the gospel because it's life to my bones. Without it, you have no life and no hope. The world is going crazy right now, but if you understand the power of the gospel, you're not. Why? Because you know what? I'm in the hands of God. Nothing can remove me from the hand of God. He has purpose for my life. He's completely sovereign. And when the world is falling apart and they're living in anxiety, I'm living in hope for the life to come, for the return of Jesus, for the resurrection of dead. Like, man, I am living in the life of Christ if you're a Christ follower. But if you're not, you have nothing. You run to the government for hope. Save me, government. But they can't because they're just as broken as all of us. It's Jesus we need to run to in that truth. Uh, We're going to end our our message in just a couple moments, but Paul internalized the gospel. It's so beautiful. This is such a picture of what a matured internalization of the gospel of peace looks like. 1 Corinthians 4.3 says this, I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I don't even judge myself anymore. What an amazing weight to fall off your shoulders. I don't even judge myself anymore because if God's for me, if God forgave me, I don't need to hold it. If God has brought peace in my life, I'm gonna live through that. How many of you today would love not to even judge yourself anymore? Not to look back on your past anymore, not to feel guilt and shame. That's made possible through the gospel of peace. That's made possible when you say, you know what? I'm not just gonna believe it. Man, I'm going to interrupt every negative thought, every lie of the enemy. And you know what? I'm going to invite Jesus to heal this area of my life so that I can project from a place of gain and not from a place of pain. Hey, what's up? My name is Armando. I'm the pastor of Fusion Church, and we are so excited that you followed along in this message. We hope that you enjoyed this message. If you did, make sure that you hit the like and subscribe button down below. If you feel led by God to support the ministry of Fusion Church, you can do that in a number of ways. Number one, pray for us, pray with us. God is doing some great things here at Fusion Church, and that is probably the best way for you to be part of it. The second way is if you live locally, please come out and visit us. Come uh, come and enjoy service with us, and if you feel led to, you can even join our team and become a teammate. And the third way is if you feel led by God to give to the ministry of Fusion Church, you can do so by going to our website, www.fusionchurchny.com, and hit the giving tab. With that being said, guys, God bless you. Hope you enjoy the next message.